got a speaker from uh, San Francisco <coughs> State at the Tiburon Center, which is a really fun place to be if you haven't been in the San Francisco Bay at the Tiburon Center. Very much worth visiting. Um, Michelle started before she jumped to Hawaii in, in Wisconsin, so you must like uh, uh, Lake Zooplankton. I fell in love with Lake Zooplankton a long time ago. Um, but she spent right from Wisconsin, which would let you know lots about fresh water, right into Hawaii, which is certainly what I, where I would have gone. And you see, and are you probably sampling the Kaneohe Bay, huh? yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if you've been in Honolulu, the, the first refuge you can get to so you don't feel like you're caught in a large city is Kaneohe Bay. It's a beautiful place. There's a nice little lab down there. That bay used to be contaminated with sewer. Now it's all recovered. It's a, a remarkable spot. Now she's at the Tiburon Lab also looking at zooplankton there, which she did in Kaneohe Bay, and she's going to talk about that today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, is my mic working? Or can you guys hear me? You can all hear me? All right, great. Well, thank you all for coming today. I'm excited to be here. This is my first time at Moss Landing Marine Labs, and it is, it's gorgeous out here. I love it. And I'm going to be talking to you today about a broad range of things, a lot of my master's and PhD work, and then a little side project, and my current work, uh, which is looking at the diets of um, larval long fin smelt using next generation sequencing. So my background, as he mentioned, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and then after a short break, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, I moved to Hawaii and entered the oceanography program. And during that time, I developed a molecular method to identify and quantify larval copepods in mixed samples. And then I continued into the PhD program there, and uh, continued with larval copepods and trying to figure out their role in the ecosystem in Kaneohe Bay, offshore Hawaii, and did some copepod feeding studies and applied that method that I developed to study population dynamics of multiple species. And now I'm working at the Romberg Tiburon Center, as I mentioned. And I would say that my specialty is uh, zooplankton identification, larval ecology, as well as molecular methods, and applying them to address ecological questions of interest. So what I'll be talking to you today is about zooplankton diversity and DNA barcoding, quantitative molecular methods for zooplankton ecology, food web ecology, and molecular food web ecology, because I've done a little bit of both, and then, of course, take-home messages. And I think this is a good picture to start with. If you haven't been initiated into the wonderful world of zooplankton and zooplankton diversity, this picture captures it pretty well. Um, this is by Christian Sarday. You can find it in their book called Plankton that came out a few years ago. It was part of the Terra Oceans exploration uh, describing the diversity, um, in part describing the diversity of, of plankton in the oceans, amongst other things. And I just love this picture because it shows all sorts of body shapes, forms, gelatinous, spiny, all sorts of adaptations that have been uh, incorporated into uh, zooplankton for them to survive in their habitat. But most of my work has had to do with copepods, uh, as, especially in my master's and PhD work. And oh, jumped ahead, darn it. <laughs> Gave you a little hint there. So to uh, somebody who hasn't looked at what you catch when you do a zooplankton toe. This is a concentrated uh, zooplankton that you might capture offshore Hawaii when you tow a net through the water and then look at it through a microscope. And to the uninitiated, um, you might see things that are recognizable if you fish larvae, things that look like bugs, some shells, uh, but otherwise it might not look like too much. But when you go and look closer uh, and here I've gone and circled everything that I could identify to be a copepod of some species or life stage. Um, and that's just to illustrate that copepods are often a dominant component of marine planktonic ecosystems in many aquatic ecosystems around the world. And that means that they're very important in marine food webs as grazers of phytoplankton and as prey to things like fish and fish larvae. They have a complex life history where they develop from an egg into uh, nauplius. They uh, molt through six nauplier stages in total, go into capepidite stages, 
and then the final adult with 12 developmental stages total, so it's kind of wild. Um, and just like many other animals around the world, the large taxa are much better studied, um, and that's in part because of the standard use of 200 micron mesh nets, which every net has trade-offs. If you use too wide of a net, you miss the small things. If you use too fine of a net, you miss the large things. But the standard 200 micron nets are great, but they can miss up to 90% of the small taxa abundance and up to 30% of the biomass. And this includes things like small calanoid copepods, cyclopoid copepods, things that are small bodied and very abundant, um, as well as the early life stages. And because of their small size, uh, the early life history stages are often ignored. And I like to use this image to illustrate that point, um, that there, it is very difficult to tell species apart at these early Noplier stages. So um, these two species, Parvocalinus crassirostris and Bistulina similis, are two species that are uh, dominant in tropical and subtropical embayments around the world. They coexist. Um, as adults, you can tell them apart. But as Noplii, they are indistinguishable morphologically. Um, and that means that people who do study copepods and their Noplii often lump them into the total Noplii category, which is all fine depending on your research questions. But we know that they can be important ecologically as individual species, that even as early as the first Noplier stage, they have species-specific swimming, feeding, and escape behaviors that make them potentially important in marine food webs. So the ways that we get around this challenge in identifying species is using things, techniques like DNA barcoding, which you may be familiar with. Um, and this is basically just using a gene marker to fingerprint a species. And this is a nice example that's from the lab that I came from with Erica Goertze at University of Hawaii that she produced with the master's student on a species called Holoptilus longicordis. Um, this is a copepod that is considered to be cosmopolitan, present in global oceans, even in the Atlantic where they didn't study it in this study. Um, the morphology looks the same, uh, but it turns out that it's genetically complex. So this, these are haplotype plots just showing uh, different genetic types that are present in each of those sampling locations. And you can see that some of the colors show uh, distribution is spread across ocean basins in some cases, but there are others that are more isolated. So um, it's a lot more complex than, uh, than it might look when you're just looking at a species morphology. So when I started at the University of Hawaii, um, we kind of had one main question that kind of started driving my path and the work that I ended up doing, and that's, can we use a DNA-based method to estimate the abundance or biomass of Noplii in field samples? And this was inspired in part by work by Durbin in 2008, who uh, they were making efforts to quantify ingestion on Noplii of Akarshatansa by predatory copepods. And so they found this nice relationship of mitochondrial copy number and biomass of individual noplii that they used to back out ingestion rates on Akarshatansa noplii. Um, and so I used this. Um, so I eventually used this. But before I could do that in my study area, uh, I had to figure out what the genetic diversity of my species of interest would be. And, and was, and it hadn't been described before in my study region of Kaneohe Bay, uh, which is on the windward side of Oahu, Hawaii, if you're not familiar. The University of Hawaii is located down here. Um, zooming in, Kaneohe Bay is a uh, fairly well-described embayment, in part because of its proximity to the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Uh, but my study site was located primarily within the south part, uh, within the southern region of the bay. Uh, we know that is usually nitrogen limited. The chlorophyll A levels uh, tend to be low with around 0.5 micrograms per liter, and it's dominated by small phytoplankton in the phytoplankton community. In this part of the bay, there are four dominant species of copepods, two calanoids and two cyclopoids, Bistulina similis and Parvocalinus crassirostris, as I said before, um, and then two cyclopoids, Oithona attenuata and Oithona simplex. 
And Oithona simplex, even though it's the smallest species, it is the most abundant by far out of all of these species. Um, and part of why I chose the south part of the bay is because the water, the water residence time within this region is around one month, which is greater than the development time of my species, and therefore we can have confidence that we're following one population over a daily time series that we're doing, that we're studying. So my first task as a master's student was to go out and survey the diversity across the bay. So this is the full embayment with the south part of the bay. And I found an interesting pattern in the copepod community. There were three species that were present only in the north bay. One species found from the mid-bay northward, and then four species that were found throughout the bay, the four species that I already told you. Um, and with that work, I just it published a small DNA barcoding paper on the mitochondrial CO1 gene of these species. And one of the interesting results from that work, um, this is showing a table of my Kanyoe Bay species on the left and the closest genetic, uh, what we call a haplotype, closest genetic type, either within the NCBI database or in some cases if it was within my own species, <laughs> but named something different. Um, and one of the interesting results was this Undinula, vul Undinula vulgaris, which was one of the North Bay only species, was genetically similar enough to this coast of China species that we can basically assume it's a mixing population. Whereas these other species, uh, including the Oithonas, which are notoriously challenging to get DNA barcodes from, um, were genetically distant enough that, well, most of what we could say was that they are not the same as the same named species in the genetic database. So more work really needs to be done to taxonomically analyze what, um, whether these are in fact the same species that are named the same thing. So really, since this is the most isolated archipelago in the world, Hawaii, it's likely that these are different species, but more work clearly needs to be done. But I got what I needed to do genetic analysis, so I had my um, my DNA barcodes, and now, and now what? So one of the big uh, reasons that we wanted to study in the subtropics uh, is because in these environments, we have nauplii year-round. So this is a prior study by Scheinberg in 2004 showing the abundance of nauplii versus calanoid and cyclopoid adults. And you can see right away that the nauplii are abundant, present and abundant year-round. Um, and that also means that there are no easy to follow cohorts, which you might have in temperate and polar regions where the diversity is also much lower. Um, so you might have one dominant species that, uh, that whose adults are abundant when they're producing nauplii, and then you can follow that all the way through development over time. So if you want to ask any questions about the copepod population and what they're doing in the environment here, it's really hard to, you can't tell the nauplii apart. Um, so you hit a wall. And one interesting uh, dynamic that we knew about before starting all of our work was the effect of storm events on Kanyoe Bay and the ecology within the bay. And this is, I love this picture because you can see the freshwater plume working its way out to sea. In the distance you can just see the edge of the island and I'm looking sort of northwards from, uh, from the South Bay. Um, and there's, this is all just obscured with rain. But basically, we know that the first flushing storm after a long, dry period causes uh, a, blue, a boost of nutrients being flushed in from land. And that stimulates productivity and causes rapid succession in the phytoplankton and zooplankton community. Um, this, in general, has been observed. Um, and a prior study described the phytoplankton changes in response to the storm event, which is shown here, the large phytoplankton, mostly diatoms. Um, and this is just to illustrate that uh, from one day to the next, the phytoplankton community can be completely different in this environment. It's a very rapidly changing system. So of course, this probably has rapid effects on the zooplankton community. And they detailed the copepod abundance and how that changed over time between the nauplii juveniles and adults based on counts. And they found an interesting pattern that really made me question what was going on. So if you follow this closed triangles, these are the copepod nauplii. At this red peak 
you would expect within relevant development times for that red peak to develop into capepidites by the time it hits the blue arrow and into adults by the time it hits the yellow arrow. But you're not seeing translation of all of these, this noplier biomass in abundance into the later stages. So that suggests that there's some significant source of mortality that's likely occurring. But because we don't know what species are there, we don't really know what's happening, where they're going. So um, I pursued that question in my studies, and part of my work was storm chasing, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But first, I'm going to talk about the development of the quantitative PCR method that I did first. So the basic idea is using those DNA barcodes, I could then design species-specific primers that target one species only and amplify the DNA of only that species. And then using the special machine to quantify the amount of DNA, you can then translate that into how many animals are there. So the first task was figure out how much DNA is in an individual stage of each of my target species. And I started with Parvocalinus crassirostris. And that's in part because it was abundant in the bay and we had it in culture. So that allowed me to know what species I was looking at when I was doing my extractions and analysis. And then you can see that it changes as they grow from nauplius to adult. And so I used a size fractionation sort of protocol, a series of mesh sieves that I could pour a sample through and flush them down to the proper level and separate the smallest nauplii from the biggest adults and have more confidence in my abundance estimates based on DNA copy number. So the general workflow when working with a mixed sample includes these culture calibrations to calculate the DNA for an average individual in a size fraction so that I could then take a mixed environmental sample, size fractionate it, preserve and extract the DNA, measure the DNA content of my target species and divide that by the DNA for an average individual to back out the number of individuals. So that's kind of the general workflow. So then applying that, not to mixed samples, but to split cultured samples, um, we sh were able to show that it works really well, actually. So this was take a, take a sample from culture, split it in half, size fractionate both halves, count what's in one half, and compare that to the qPCR-based count on the other half, and you get this really lovely linear relationship. So that's just showing that it works really well. And actually, a uh, plug for this lab, because I was so excited to see that it was used, um, this came out a few weeks ago, a study in the Great Barrier Reef on the crown of thorns starfish and quantifying their larval abundance across uh, different areas of the Great Barrier Reef. And they cited me. I was very excited. And that's the perfect application, really, of this type of method. Have a species of interest that you want to quantify, develop it, and then do your study with what you have. That's great. So. Abundance is great when you can actually culture the animals and you can develop that calibration curve really nicely. But if you can't culture the animals, then what do you do? Well, uh, we had challenges culturing all four of our copepod species, but we knew that there was a relationship of animal size to biomass. So instead of calibrating it to individual stages, I calibrated it to um, basically just the, the size fractionated uh, amount of biomass in one size fraction that I measured with qPCR and then estimated the biomass based on um, body length. And I did that for a total of four species, the four dominant species, in collaboration with a postdoc that was in our lab, Kate Hansen. And we applied that, I applied that to individuals, the bulk culture and mixed species. And we found the same nice linear relationship from individuals all the way up to mixed species. So this is samples with all four species in them, measured for, the bi measured for the copy number of each species, and then also compared to the biomass estimate for that sample. So um, it seems like a really promising and linear relationship um, and application of using DNA for animal biomass. So now we go storm chasing. So this was an exciting time of my life where um, I wanted to catch that first flush storm of the season after a long, dry summer. And in Hawaii, 
it can be kind of hard to predict exactly how much rain might fall on the islands. So there were usually a few weeks in the fall where I was like checking the NOAA weather site every day and trying to mobilize my volunteers and saying it could happen tomorrow. <laughs> and um, it was very exciting. And we were successful, and, uh, and I'll show you that data soon. Uh, but basically, we did three two-week time series where I went out and collected daily samples in South Kaneohe Bay, including vertical zooplankton toes, as well as whole water to capture the nauplii that still aren't collected even with a fine mesh net, uh, phytoplankton samples, and water column data for temperature and salinity and that sort of thing. And I'm only going to talk about comparing the summer sort of calm, non-storm period, no external input sort of system to the first flush storm. And so first, I'll show you the environment. Um, again, there was little, little to no rainfall during the summer period on the left. The mean chlorophyll A in this part of the bay is around 0.5, as I said. Uh, but I didn't take measurements, unfortunately. Um, but during the fall storm, I did take chlorophyll measurements, and you can see that the chlorophyll peaked within days after the storm occurred on the 23rd, and I started sampling every day thereafter. Um, and we had received over six centimeters of rain for that event. And right away, we could see by the clogging in the net and uh, under the scope that there was a huge diatom bloom after the storm event within one day. So within 24 hours, there was an immediate response in the phytoplankton community. And these are epifluorescent slide images that show you autotrophic versus heterotrophic um, different types of phytoplankton that are present. And the red fluorescence is showing you just the autotrophic diatoms that are in there. And that's a bloom of Ketoceros for anyone who's interested. That diatom bloom was not present within six days. It was totally dead and gone, um, which is amazing because it's so dense. So you would expect that the phytoplankton community would, of course, have a big impact on what's happening in the zooplankton community. And so uh, first I'll show you the uh, biomass from qPCR for what I'll call early nauplii and mid to late nauplii, so the smallest size fraction versus the larger size fractions for the four species. And during the non-storm period, it looks pretty boring, um, and that's because uh, the system seems to be at a stable state during this period. There's not a lot of input or um, things going out. It's just mortality, balancing, recruitment. But during the storm, we see a lot more happening. And I'll break this down into what, what I think is happening with each individual species. So Athona simplex, which is our dominant adult, um, had an immediate response in the early nauplii. And we know that these copepods can ramp up their egg production in less than 24 hours. They can already produce eggs and have nauplii popping up. So this is not totally surprising, but it is 14-fold higher nauplier biomass than the pre-storm sort of levels. So that's really interesting. Also, there seems to be a hint of a cohort production signal which was something that we could never look for before in this system because of the inability to tell the nauplii apart by species. Um, and so it seems like these early nauplii are developing into mid to late nauplii within three or four days. Whereas for the other Oithona species, it seems to have a very different dynamic in its nauplier production and survival. Um, it seems to be a more gradual species that's uh, perhaps taking advantage of the later blooms uh, and the succession of phytoplankton. For Parvocalinus crassirostris, it seemed to have a threefold increase, so a lesser increase in the nauplier production initially, but you see this huge increase in mid to late nauplii later on, which to me suggests that there might be higher survival of the nauplii that are produced by this species um, as compared to other uh, events or other species. Whereas Bistulina similis was pretty boring, so there's not much to say about that species, and I'm not sure. It is the largest of the four, so it could just be constantly preyed upon by uh, fish larvae and everything that are around in the embayment, and that could just be controlling its population. Um, another interesting feature, which I haven't mentioned, was this crash after about eight days. And I don't have predation data to show what might be happening, but I do think that that could be uh, something that is causing that uh, crash in the nauplius population. 
And we know this because, well, I think this because uh, we know that Nauplia are a critical prey of fish larvae. And this is a plot from a, one of my committee members, Petra Lenz, and a study they did looking at uh, fish larval capture success on Nauplii capepidites in adults. And they found that early fish larvae have higher capture su success on Nauplia and that they can't even capture later stages uh, because they just don't have the capability. And those adult copepods are really hard to catch if you've ever tried to chase them in a petri dish. They jump away really fast. Uh, so you imagine these larval fishes might have a really hard time. And so Nauplia are a critical prey. And we've also seen sort of peaks like this, where high nauplia abundance can coincide with peak fish larval abundance. But unfortunately, I didn't have any collaborators to collect uh, fishes and fish larvae at the same time of my zooplankton sampling. So I can really only hypothesize about this being what's going on in our environment. Another possibility is that the rapid changes in the phytoplankton community are limiting their food resources and they're all starving, um, which is possible. So as a part of my dissertation, I also did some grazing studies with my um, And that's because it, there seem to be conflicting uh, impressions of whether or not they're important grazers in ecosystems. So one prior study found that a Carchaton Sinoplii can actually remove quite a bit, 20% of primary production, um, and they can consume over 280% of their body carbon per day. So that's a ton of ingestion. But other studies have found that they're insignificant grazers, removing less than 9% of the prey community and less and around 50% of their body carbon. But I think that they may be particularly important in the subtropics where Nauplii are abundant year-round and their rapid development requires high feeding rates. So I did a grazing study, um, a traditional bottle incubation experiment looking at prey removal over that incubation, five grazing experiments over 10 days with Bistulina similis and Parvocalinus crassirostris from culture um, on the in situ prey community. And I quantified the prey community using a coulter counter, which counts cell size and abundance, and also looked at prey types, but I'll talk mainly about the uh, cell size and abundance data. Um, I also did net toes on the in situ Nauplius community to use my quantitative PCR method to quantify their in situ abundance. And we did concurrent dilution experiments, which are currently in review in Marine Ecology Progress Series. I won't talk about that either. Uh, but the initial prey community looked a little bit like this. This is showing the biomass of the prey size groups from 2 to 5 microns up to 35 microns um, over time during the five experiments. Um, and it increased by about fourfold over the course of our experiments um, because of a storm event that we did not anticipate uh, before planning our sampling. So this was a surprise late season storm. Um, that increased productivity. But because it was a late season storm, we didn't actually see the same diatom bloom over this period. It, it was kind of weird, it was odd, but because it was, there was, were prior rainfall events that flushed most of the nutrients and silica in the, into the coastal waters, there was a much uh, less pronounced response. And I won't talk about all the results, but one of the interesting results that I found was differences in selectivity between the two species. So this is an electivity plot. And basically, if it's greater than positive 0.5, it's considered positive selection for a prey in proportion to its availability in the environment. Whereas if it's less than negative 0.5, it's selecting against it. And what I saw was that neither of the two species had strong positive electivity for any of the prey size groups, but Bistulina similis did have some strong negative selectivity against the smallest prey, the two to five micron prey. And um, there seems to be some switching in prey selection. If you remember, the initial prey community increased by over fourfold over the course of these experiments, so the community was changing. And I think that when overall prey was less abundant, Bistulina was selecting the largest thing that it could potentially grab that it liked, maybe. That's assuming they have 
capabilities and pray for reference. We, we won't go into that, but it seems like they do have a preference and that that changes over time, selecting less for the 15 to 20 micron group over time and more for the 20 to 35 micron prey group over time, but consistently selecting against the smallest prey. That's all great, but are they important? Are they even having an impact on their prey community? So in order to do that, I had to figure out what the abundance of each of these species was in the environment. So I used my qPCR method to quantify their abundance. And I found that Parvocalanus crassirostris was uh, almost uh, tenfold more abundant than the Bestialina similis. And I didn't really talk about their ingestion rates in general, but they had generally equal ingestion rates across the two species, and they were capable of preying on the same range of prey. Um, but because of Parvocalanus's high abundance, it had a pen uh, potentially high grazing impact. And so this is showing the percent of the initial community that they're capable of removing per day um, of the different prey size groups and chlorophyll A. And you don't have to look at the numbers, it's just clear that Parvocalanus has a greater impact and the highest potential removal was up to 24% of the largest prey size group and up to 13% of the chlorophyll A. So that's a potentially significant impact. So brief conclusions about the copepods before I move on. Um, the diversity of species in Hawaii is potentially novel and needs further work with taxonomists to see if the island has unique species, which I'm sure it does. Genetically, they are unique. The mitochondrial DNA copy number is a useful measure of animal biomass. And with using this tool, we can see species level dynamics and changes in recruitment and mortality rates over time. And nauplii are potentially important grazers. They're par particularly important when they're abundant in grazing down phytoplankton blooms. So now for something completely different. Um, because I'm a little crazy, I was recruited and invited to work on a side project during my last year of my PhD. Um, and this is what it was all about, was looking at larval diversity in the deep sea to help contribute to uh, figuring out what the biological impact of potential manganese nodule mining would be. And if you don't know, manganese nodules are these valuable uh, rare earth minerals that are in these concentrated patches in the seafloor, and this happens to be one of those concentrated patches uh, called the clarion clipperton fracture zone. And all the, this is just a map of all the different areas that have been delineated to different countries to do first do biological baseline studies and then potentially mine these minerals. So this was a big collaborative effort um, with people at the University of Hawaii like Craig Smith and the UK Natural History Museum and Senckenberg in Germany. Um, but my part was very small. It was just do some DNA barcoding on the larval miroplankton to know what we have potentially down there. And I wasn't a part of the sample collection, but this is how they collected these samples, was basically taking something that I believe is called an elevator, um, where you attach this plankton pump onto this float and weighted buoy that they drop in the ocean and it sinks down to the seafloor and it pumps the volume of water through a mesh sort of collector and then when it's done you release the weights and it flows back up to the surface. It's a pretty cool idea. Um, it's used for a lot of different types of studies. So with this project I was charged with doing barcoding and for that I sequenced a portion of the mitochondrial CO1 the 18S and 16S are our RNA genes. And I did the three genes because um, essentially they all tell you a little bit different information and they're also uh, the primers that have been developed for broad species target things, some things better than others. So you'll have some success with one group that will totally fail with another. So uh, for me it was best to use three different markers. And the mitochondrial CO1 is better for species level. So this is just showing the su success in amplification of the gastropods, bivalves, and polychaetes that I was working with. And this is just the number of individuals. I had mostly polychaetes in these samples. And I had a range of success from 0% with the bivalves and the 16S primers to up to 94% with the gastropods and the 18S. 
And if I had continued work on this project, I would, of course, try and up those numbers. But it was only a six-month sort of temporary thing. So I had to do as much as I could in that time period. As far as results go, these are all very preliminary. But I'll just show you I had very few species level identities um, to comparing to the NCBI genetic database where most of this information is stored. Um, for example, the one here is a polychaete worm that had 100% identity to the CL1, which means it's a good species level ID. But for the other genes, usually they're only, like, particularly the 18S, I believe it's only good for family level ID. And some of these other ones had such low hits that I don't think I even have a family level ID. So clearly, more work needs to be done. And some of our collaborators in the UK Natural History Museum, they were sequencing adult, benthic adults of the, from the same study area. And my initial comparisons came up with no matches to them. So it just tells you how little we know about deep sea diversity and how much more needs to be done. So on to my current work. Um, and with this, I, it might seem a little bit out of the zooplankton world, but really it's not because these fishes are eating zooplankton. Um, and basically I'm using high throughput sequencing to look at the diet of larval longfin smelt. And just a little bit about the smelt. This is a threatened native species in the San Francisco estuary. It's an important forage fish. And fishes, and we know that fishes in the San Francisco estuary have been declining for decades, and that many factors are affecting their populations, uh, but that food availability is a critical factor that affects the survival of these larval fishes. And larvae are of interest in particular, in particular because this is a sensitive period of their development where they need to get the food to survive and develop into later stages, but they are very rudimentary and may not be able to capture enough prey uh, if, if it's not abundant enough. So some of the questions that I will be addressing, I just started this three months ago, so I don't have much for results, but some of the questions that I'll be addressing is what are the young fishes eating? What prey are we missing with traditional gut content analysis where you just tear it open and identify partially digestive things? Does the diet differ in different regions of the San Francisco estuary? And is another more abundant larval fish species, like the Pacific herring, con consuming similar prey? And the ideal hope is to identify previously unknown prey uh, types that might provide additional management ideas to support these fish and their food resources. But the diet studies can be challenging. And part of the reason I'm using DNA is because, well, sometimes all you get is unidentifiable goo. So this is, of course, not a longfin smell. This is a mesopelagic fish called the black swallower that has adaptations to consume things that are bigger than its own body and then slowly digest them over time. We just happened to catch one of these in one of the research cruises I participated in uh, a few months ago. And we just tore it open to see if we could tell what was inside. And it was mostly fish meat and a couple of squid beaks. So we knew it eat ate some squid and probably some fish. But as far as further identification, there's no way. Um, so that's one of the biggest problems. With our fishes in the estuary and a lot of small plank uh, planktivorous fishes, crustaceans tend to be the dominantly identified things with traditional methods. But that's because you would imagine that softer bodied things might get digested faster and become less identifiable much more quickly. So of course, with DNA, you get a much wider variety of prey. But one of the challenges with molecular diet studies is that you potentially end up with a lot of unknown sequences in the diet. So the comparison is only as good as the database that you're comparing it to. Um, so I plan to collaborate with local researchers like John Geller uh, to fill gaps in the knowledge, as well as use my own DNA barcoding and identification skills to ident identify and barcode likely candidates for whatever unknown sequences I do get. And so this is my study area where I'm going to be looking at uh, larval fishes in the San Francisco Bay, San Pablo Bay, Suisun, and parts of South Bay. Uh, different habitat types like the shoals, the channel surface, channel bottom, and tidal marshes uh, to compare their diets across these different habitats. 
And so far, we've collected paired larval fish and zooplankton toes uh, from February to June, and we got a lot of long, skinny larvae. And these are actually soon going to be identified by a company called Tenera, because I can't identify larval long fin smelt. Um, they're going to sort them for me, and then I will get them back and do the gut analysis. And then recently, we tried to collect juveniles and their prey, but we only got about 10. So uh, despite our best efforts, we weren't able to collect juvenile long fin smelt this year. Um, so we have to figure out what's going on there, uh, whether all those larvae died or if they're just hiding somewhere that they don't normally hide where we catch them. But progress so far with the genetic, um, with genetic gut content analysis, um, you use DNA primers that basically sequence everything in the gut. And you would imagine if you are trying to get something out of the gut or you extract a whole stomach, that most of the DNA that's in there is going to be of your predator. And you don't really want that. So one technique that people have used is to develop blocking primers that uh, allow you to amplify everything except for the predator's DNA. And um, so I did that, and I was able to successfully develop long fin smelt blocking primers that do not amplify long fin smelt DNA. This is a lovely picture of a gel uh, that just uh, sort of illustrates that they seem to be working. So this is 100% fish. There's no amplification of that. And then various mixes of either fish and prey or, fi or water and prey, just to show that the uh, blocking primer is not interfering with ampli amplification of the prey DNA. And the prey DNA is just mixed zooplankton samples that I had and extracted. All right, so take home messages. Despite great, great efforts across the world, more work needs to be done building DNA barcode databases and supporting DNA barcodes with taxonomic identifications, which can be the cha most challenging thing to do, especially in the deep sea. Larvae may be difficult to identify, but DNA-based techniques allow us to get around those challenges and pursue broader questions. Copepodinopliae can contribute greatly to zooplankton abundance and biomass, and a broader investigation of nopliae is needed given their abundance and high grazing potential, especially in tropical regions. And DNA-based techniques have uh, promise uh, for application to measure biomass of diverse species. Um, it isn't there yet, though. With high-throughput sequencing in its current state, you often have primer bias, where the primers amplify one type better than another. So having confidence in the quantitative nature of that is not quite there. But, uh, but I think it will happen soon with advances in molecular techniques that are being developed as we speak. And as far as my diversity in diets of a threatened species, to be continued. I'm looking forward to uh, working through these uh, larval diets and, and presenting that at a later time. With that, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. of the DNA copy number, you're measuring the mitochondrial copies, right? In a sample that has some number of, you know, say, early stage nuclei. And if, I guess, you know how many nuclei were in that sample, so say I extracted five, just comparing the amount of mitochondrial copies in five copepods. I don't know if I, I understand. Know mitochondria there are. That I don't know, I guess. Okay, that so maybe it's just semantic, and that's, that's yeah. how I read it. 
Yeah, so it's, it's more like how many copies of that gene are in the whole copepod rather than in a mitochondria, in how many mitochondria, which is uh, potentially complex because, of course, that's not going to be the same in every individual. There's going to be variability in the mitochondria. But, um, but working with this, I worked with large enough numbers that I think it controlled for the individual variability in copy number within a copepod. Does that make sense? In your master's research, you said that the, during the first flush, there was a large nutrient load introduced into the bay, and then that caused the algal bloom, which caused the copepod bloom. How much of that nutrient load is caused by like farm runoff or anthropogenic effects? A lot of it is anthropogenic, especially um, there are parts of that uh, bay, large parts of it, that are just built up, uh, the Kenyoi town and everything in between. And a little bit further north, there are taro fields, and I think there's a small amount of livestock and stuff. I guess it's not nearly as much as would be here. I mm -hmm. can't say a lot, but a lot of it is anthropogenic. So I'm curious then, is if we were, because we're doing a little bit of uh, ag water runoff mitigation for nutrients, and if that would then translate down to the changing communities or anything from the coat level. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine it would. It would probably reflect a, well, it would reflect a pre-agricultural mm -hmm. sort of state, so maybe it would be good ecologically, I guess, but, but maybe, it, I mean, it would result in lower productivity theoretically mm -hmm. overall. Yeah. Yes? So what do you think the drivers are the spatial differences in the copepod community? I think a lot of oceanography, um, especially because we saw those oceanic species in the North Bay. And I didn't point it out, but um, there are all these patch reefs, and there are a couple of channels that are cut into Canyon Bay where they used to bring small ships into the port there because there's a Marine Corps base and everything. Um, and they know that the tidal flows come in and out of those channels really rapidly, bringing with it the plankton. So, and that happened, there's, there's one in the North Bay, there's a channel in the Central Bay, but I think the channel in the Central Bay is a bit longer, so there must be some sort of mitigation preventing those oceanic species from coming in as far in the more southern parts of the bay. Um, so I think it's mostly sort of tidal flows and oceanic influences. And then the retention in the South Bay, because it's covered on three sides, plus some patch reefs and things kind of blocking it. So the wind patterns tend to recirculate the water in the South Bay. Yeah. So there's a lot of your species in San Francisco, okay? So I'm just curious, do you know the plankton or the either the fibers or the plankton, what portion of the, the diversity is introduced? Not you. Um <laughs> I think John might be able to answer that better than me at this point, but I think my impression is that there haven't been any recent introductions. But there were a series you know, over history. But most of what has been introduced is fairly well established um, and I think fairly well known. Yeah. yeah, John, do you have any comments for that? I know you've done some work on invasives there. But what fraction of yeah, so the is? Yeah. If there's a, you know, 200 species identifiable, what portion of those are? I think, like abundance-wise, I think there are a few invaders that have become really successful, like within the copepods. So, um, we're actually we're analyzing data right now to answer that. But from a purely molecular perspective, there's like some of the data um, Michelle just showed a lot of the 
significant number of uh, introduced species, larvae of introduced species in plankton, but it's, it's the total the total identified metazone diversity is is um, a larger fraction of the identified diversity. Yeah, why? Yeah, well, one of the reasons I asked was that you know, I've been just been harvesting with these guys for a long time, and their number one food editor is eaten by them is yellow and goby, which is the Chinese from China. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, I mean, it's taken over. Um, mm -hmm. My data, I was too dark to fish, but I have a part of the fish, so there's, there's sequences. Yes? Um, so in your PhD section of the presentation, uh, you talked about how some of the species that you had found out in Hawaii were um, sort of like in a mixing population because they were so similar to species that had been reported on out in like China. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, this might be kind of an obvious uh, answer to this question, but the copepods have such quick um, generation times, and they, I mean, quiet, as you said, is extremely isolated. So when you say mixing population, I mean, I assume it's a fairly ubiquitous uh, species if, it, if it's, you know, identical almost to species from species in Hawaii and species in China. So, I mean, I can't really imagine those organisms really mixing unless they're just all across the entire Pacific. If you, if you could just, like, clarify kind of what's going on with that. That one, and so there were two species that had really close genetic identities mm -hmm. to things in other parts of the world, and those are those were both in the North Bay, um, where uh, brings it back to sort of the physical oceanography, yeah. where it flows there's circulation with the open ocean up there. Um, so I imagine that those were actually open ocean species that were just flushed into the bay. That they're there, they may have small reproducing populations, but they're mostly out in the open ocean and exchanging actively with that population, which, yeah, throughout the North Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. Are we done? Thank you again. <laughs>